Okay. Because now we have a three, around 400 participants to log in. Hello, good morning, everyone. Long time no see. Morning. 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 Good morning. morning. June. Good morning, you. Thank you to join the meeting. So we'll talk again about today the schedule. After two minutes, uh, we will start the video. The video is just only... Actually, that video is about what? One minute, two minutes. Two minutes is about the school and some employees. After two minutes, we will review about... Uh, the video is around our societies. And then we will start uh, the opening video at 10 o'clock. Around ten minutes, and then we have introductions of you, each of the president of the each countries, and then we will have um, academic section. The academic section is around one and a half hours. The academic section is continue the five topics. So after one and a half hours, we have a Q and A, and then we have live again. And for the end, we have uh, three minutes. Is about the uh, Mr. Kim Kim Montin from Yama, the video, and then we will do in the closing. So today the schedule is around like that. So we have a lifetime is not too much. A bomb to the video. I know. 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 Miss Yin Ryu will join this webinar when she arrives at hospitals and she is driving now. Yeah, I know, yes. No, never mind. Other can be logged in before 10 o'clock. Yeah. That's okay. We will start a video.
an unforgettable experience. An inspirational moment. Adding richness and color to daily life to make it more meaningful. Building trust and confidence for when only the finest quality will do. We at Canon have pursued the world of imaging for these moments that matter. Moments where we can capture stunning natural and human beauty. And can even see the smallest details inside the human body. At Canon Medical Systems, we develop and manufacture diagnostic imaging equipment that embraces life itself. Utilizing meticulous Japanese technology, Canon has been at the forefront of ultrasound research and development. Collaborating with our clinical partners to help patients. For over 50 years, delivering an extensive portfolio of innovative technologies that now support clinical practice in more than 150 countries globally. Faster, clearer, more beautiful images. Capturing the moments that matter. Supporting more informed healthcare decisions. Our mission to produce the finest images will never stop. Because every life is valuable. Made for life. therapies and many more will. It's a rapidly expanding and changing field. So we designed the Artis Icono family for you to tap this potential for growth and innovation and cope with the mounting cost pressure. Based on future-ready technology that makes different disciplines feel at home in the same lab, it is easy to operate and even easier to monitor and maintain. 
Find out how Artis Icono will help you to optimize clinical operations for different disciplines, for individual interventionalists, and for your hospital as a whole. Artis Icono, an icon of innovation. Perception. Understanding. Reasoning. Creativity. Wisdom. Learning. Intelligence. The ability to think abstractly and rationally and use that thought for purposeful action the strongest tool of humankind. And a concept that we have pushed even further, making technology our strongest partner and giving us the confidence we need to make the right decisions intelligently. My exam companion is intelligence that works with you. It uses the new possibilities of digitalization to turn data into built-in expertise. To unlock the full potential of Somatome Excite. My Exam Companion helps users on their way to the consistent results that radiologists need. My Exam Companion. Intelligence that works with you. Change lies at the core of things. If you accept that, everything is possible. We took the power of digitalization and a new field strength with inherent clinical benefits to deliberately combine them to create greater clinical value. High V MRI Value Beyond Barriers Magnetom Free Max Breaking Barriers A system with helium-free MR operations cannot run for 24 hours a day. Based on a decade of innovation, we've revolutionized MR operations with the Ingenia Ambition 1.5T. Its groundbreaking blue seal magnet operates with only seven liters of helium. This fraction of the usual amount of helium is placed in the magnet during manufacturing and then fully sealed, enclosing the coolant for the rest of its lifetime. No helium can escape, and the system will stay cool, ensuring hours and hours of continuous high-performance scanning and creating peace of mind from potential helium complications. But it would not be such a game-changer if it only revolutionized helium-free MR operations. Also, no compromises are made on speed, patient comfort, staff comfort, and clinical confidence. You'll be amazed at what you can do without 1,493 liters of helium in your MR system.
technical efficacy of a gadolinium-based contrast agent depends on its relaxivity, that is, by how much T1 relaxation time is shortened. For efficient relaxation, water molecules need to bind directly to the inner coordination sphere of the gadolinium ion. By getting close to the gadolinium, each water molecule relaxes and then exchanges rapidly with the next water molecule. The molecular structure of the GBCA determines how effectively this happens. The macrocyclic GBCA gadovist has a special molecular structure with three hydroxyl groups. Those three hydroxyl groups retain water molecules through hydrogen bonding to build a large hydration sphere around the gadolinium, which is also called the second sphere. Now, not only do the water molecules in the inner sphere relax, the water molecules in the second sphere are close enough to the gadolinium ion to relax as well. The ability of gadovist to support both inner sphere and second sphere interaction with water molecules results in high relaxivity, leading to an enhanced signal intensity on the MR image. With its special molecular structure, Gadovist shortens T1 relaxation time more efficiently than other macrocyclic contrast agents, which could enhance image quality and improve diagnostic confidence.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Due to the impact of COVID-19, this meeting is being conducted by our live internet broadcast. The 21st annual meeting is being held by the Macau Radiological Technologies Association. And it is also the eighth online continuing professional development platform for Asian Radiologic Technologies Societies. The co-organizer of this year's meeting include the Association of Cambodian Radiologic Technologists, the Hong Kong Radiographers Association, the Indonesia Radiographers Association, Macau Radiological Technologists Association, the Myanmar Society of Medical Radiation Technologists, the Philippine Association of Radiologic Technologists, the Singapore Society of Radiographers, the Taiwan Association of Medical Radiation Technologists, and the Vietnam Association of Radiological Technologists. Today's meeting is also the Radiological Technologies Forum of Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. The co-organizer of the meeting include the Guangdong Medical Association Imaging Technology Branch, the Guangdong Medical Doctor Association, the Hong Kong Radiographers Association, and the Macau Radiological Technologies Association. Here, on behalf of the Macau Radiological Technologies Association, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to all of you for your support and extend a cordial welcome to everyone. According to our schedule, we will now play the national anthem. Next is an anti-epidemic work review video. Since 2019, the pandemic has been in the 整個世界彷彿瞬間停頓。曾經,我哋日以繼夜咁工作,穿著一層又一層密不透氣嘅個人防護裝備。曾經,我哋自發參與慈善抗疫工作。
，过住一整个月以医院为家嘅生活。对呢啲嘅困境，各地医护人员包括放射师仍然坚守岗位，勇敢咁对抗呢位敌人，努力肩负住守护家国嘅使命。只要我哋同心协力，一定能够战胜呢一场嘅战役。This video content comes from radiological technologists in Macau and around the world. This clip truly reflects their anti-pandemic work. During the last difficult year, radiological technologists in Macau stood on the front line with wild winds and waves. As the leaders of radiological technologists in Macau, let's listen to the voices of Mr. Kotlun K. President of the Macau Radiological Technologies Association, and Mr. Yu Jingchun, Chairman of the Macau Radiological Technologies Association. 来自世界各地的朋友，大家好。过去一年，大家都很努力嚟面对今次嘅疫情。首先咧，让大家咧向自己及向全世界人说声加油。今年很可惜，因为疫情关系。未能夠大家在澳門一齊參與呢個活動，但係我哋彼此的友誼和學術的交流會繼續的。然而，疫情好似將我們隔離，但實際上我們更加團結同埋有共同嘅目標，希望能夠真正疫情盡快完結，再和大家喺澳門除下口包，拍出一張又一張。充满笑容的照片。Stay strong and stay healthy. Thank you. 大家好，自从二零一九年出现咗 Covid 十九，我哋嘅生活、工作模式都改变咗好多。由疫情发展初期到而家，我哋嘅工作模式不断改进。因应疫情嘅发展，我哋优化咗隔离病房嘅工作流程，加强同事对感染控制嘅培训。目的係令大家可以更安全咁為隔離病房嘅病人進行診療放射工作。八月初，澳門開展咗全民核酸檢測。身為澳門放射師嘅我哋，參加咗採樣工作。所以喺抗疫面前，我哋係不單止係放射師，亦都係守護市民健康嘅專業人士。我哋澳門嘅放射師係會繼續同大家一齊齊心抗疫。Fighting COVID-19, we can do it. Thank you, Mr. Ko and Mr. Yu. Our opening ceremony ends here. Thank you. The webinar is about to begin. Please stay tuned to it. Hello. If the speed of your webcast is too slow, you may also use YouTube to watch our webinar. Please refer to the chat box for the YouTube link. Thank you. 
The scientific meeting of Macau Radiological Technologies Association is about to start. It's our honor this year to have panelists from around the world to join our webinar. Please say hello to all of our audience if I announce your name, thank you. Here, first, I, I introduce panelists from Macau, the MLTA, Mr. Dennis Yu Jin Chun. Hello, Mr. Yu. Hello, everyone. Long time no see. Welcome. Now we have Mr. Tai Wen Lok from the VALT Vietnam. Hello, Mr. Lok. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. And then we have Mr. Chick Sujianto from Indonesia. Hello, Mr. Chick. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. And we have Mr. Salah Bochai from Thailand. <coughs> Mr. Salah, hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, Kola. Hello. And we have Mr. Yin Yin. Yin Yin Fan from Myanmar. Hello, Miss Yin. Hello, everyone. Hello. We also have Miss Yin Wei O oh from <coughs> Myanmar. Hello. Here we have Miss Pichi Luna from the Philippines. Hello. 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 Good morning from the Philippines. Hello. Also, we have Mr. Nelson Wen from Hong Kong. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Hello, Cora, everyone. Good morning. Hello, hello everyone. And also we have Mr. Chun Yuan Chu from Taiwan. Hello, good morning, everyone. Morning. Also, Miss Alex Chang from Taiwan. Hello, Miss Alex. Hi, good morning, guys. Hello, hello. Miss Lai Quan Chen from Malaysia. Hello, Miss Chen. Hello, morning, Cora and everybody. Hello, long time no see. Hello, then we have Miss Dennis Chong from Singapore. Hello, Miss Dennis. Morning, Cora. Good morning, everybody. Morning. And we have Ms. Zhang Junhui from Guangdong, China. Hello, Ms. Zhang. Hello. And last but not least, Mr. Fernando Kok from Macau, the MLTA. Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, to, for joining our meeting. Through this meeting, I hope uh, everyone can learn and benefit from each and other. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fernando Koch. For all of our panelists, please stay on your web page now as we would like to take a group, capture a good photo of all of us. Please get ready. <laughs> okay, ready, smile, one, two. Salah, babe. Salah, Salah. Okay, Mr. Salah. Uh, Maybe my computer broke. I cannot, uh, cannot show my picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Ready? Uh, yeah. yeah. Everybody, get ready. Okay. One, two. Okay. I think it's finished. Okay, thank, and you. thank you all of you. Now let's start our web uh, academic forum. Welcome our moderator, Mr. Edwin Ao. Mr. Amy Ao is the academic director of MLTA. Welcome. Good morning, colleagues and friends. I am Edwin Ao. It is the 21st anniversary of MLTA. This year's scientific meeting is also the eighth online continuing professional development platform for Asian Radiology Technologies Society and the Radiological Technologies Forum of Guangdong. Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area. We have totally five speakers. Before our presentation start, please allow me to introduce a few things about our webinar page. As you can see, there is a Q&A box. If you have questions you want to ask the speaker, you can simply type in your questions in the Q&A box. Also, there is a chat box for you to chat and discuss with each other. Okay, now let's welcome our first speaker, Mr. Si Ming Chao. Mr. Si Ming Chao is the Deputy Chef of Radiological Technologies in Department of Radiology of Guangdong Province's People's Hospital in China. He is also a member of Chinese Society of Imaging Technology and a member of Guangdong Province Medical Association Imaging Technology Branch. His topic 
is study on enhancement of coronary artery in computed tomography and geography by adaptive prospective ECG gating in patients with frequent premature beats. Let's welcome Mr. Xi Ming Chao. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me to the 21st Annual Scientific Meeting of the Marco Radiology Association and Radiological Technologies Association. My name is Chao Xinming. I come from Guangdong Provincial Hospital. It's my honor to speak here, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share the topic with you. The topic of my speech is study or enhancement of coronary artery in computing tomography and angiography by adaptive prospective ECG gating in patients with frequent premature beat. At present, with the development of advanced CT, such as dual soil CT and dual lucent CT, corner CT and the algorithm with MSCT and being increasingly used for corner artery disease. The success rate of CCTA has been improved greatly in patients with arrhythmia, especially frequent premature beat. And we can use the adaptive perspective ECG gating to reduce the radiation dose. However, there are some unsatisfactory aspects, such as poor enhancement of distal segment of corner artery. In this case, we can say there were great enhancement in the proximal and middle segment of corner artery, but poor enhancement in distal segment. In other words, the enhancement degree won or decline. In fact, these patients were examined by adaptive prospective ECG gating with frequent perimeter beat. From this picture, we can see the change of heart rate worldwide from 42 to 140. This happens often, so we design the study to explore the phenomenon. The objective of the study were to explore the enhancement of corner artery in computed tomography and angiography by adaptive perspective ECG gating in frequent premature bit. According to the route to optimize the injection project of contrast media, ensure consistency of enhancement between proximal and distal segments of coronary artery, especially the great enhancement or distal segment of coronary artery. A retrospective analysis of a case series were performed. Patients suspecting CAD with frequent premature beats were detected by the second generation dual source CT by adaptive perspective ECG gating. The number of repeated scan, scan time and exam time were recorded. The CT values of outer or proximal, middle, and distal segment in right corner answer were measured and compared between the different segments.
there were 35 patients were formally brought into study. Of these cases, 15 are male and 20 are female. The average age of study group were 67 years. The average height were 162 and the average weight were 69. The average minimum and maximum heart rate were 72, 15, and 119. All patients were detected by the second generation Dior CT with adaptive perspective ECT gain team. Among scan parameters, CARDOS and CARKV were used with the reference 120 kV, 320 MAS. In order to reduce the influence of inject project of contract media, in this study, the same inject project were used. The constitution was 315. The dose were based on right 1 M and the index rate was 5. In the study, there were 6 patients with no repeated scan, 19 patients with 2 times of repeated scan, and 10 patients with 3 times of repeated scan. The average scan time was 1.65 seconds and the average exam time was 8.75. It spent longer time in patients with frequent premage beats than the patients without arrhythmia. The more time of repeated scan the longer of exam time it needs to complete the scan. These were the city values of ultra or proximal, middle and distal segment of right corner artery. From this table, we can see the city values decline gradually from proximal segment to distal segment. There was no proximal mm, there were no six efficient differences in CT value of alter between proximal and middle segment. There were significant differences in CT value of alter between middle and distal segment. All the proximal and distal segment. In our daily work, the digital segments of corner artery are frequently overlooked because they are small and thin, but they are also very important. We should ensure their good enhancement rather than poor enhancement. There were two situations, poor enhancement only on digital segment or all segments. For the former, long exam time and not enough dose of contract measure are most common causes. Specifically, it includes scan pyramids, scan less, scan mode, heart rate, and so on. For the, let, for the later, cardiac insufficient and low concentration contract measure are most common causes. We need to get the balance right between exam time and injection time of contract measure in computing tomography and algorithm. Of course, CGTA. All factors 
that can affect exam time or injection time of contract meter need to give serious consider consideration to avoid imbalance between zone. For example, scan mode. Now, adaptive perspective is indicating in the current mainstream scan mode for CCTA. This scan mode can reduce the radiation dose largely, while assure the demand quality due to the composition technique, including broaden scan, ignore scan, and repeated scan if arrhythmia happen in scanning, as well as frequent premature bit. In this case, it was a patient with frequent premature bit. The CCTA was completed by adaptive perspective ECG team. From the ECG, we can see the heart rate had a wide change from 39 to 120. And there was three premature bits at the second, third, and fourth scanning location. Then, three times of repeated scan occurred at the location. According to the repeated scan, the demand quality was ensured, but also a long exam time. There are still some shortcomings in the scan mode for patients with frequent premature bit in CCTA. The most common shorting come in pro enhancement or digital segment. This is the case I have mentioned earlier. The enhancement grid declined from proxim proximal to digital segment. The most reason for this situation was the long exam, exam time, while injection projects of contract media were set as usual. The exam time had reached 13.3 seconds, that were twice as much as usual. Three times of repeat scan were the main reason poor enhancement of digital segment of coronary artery happened if we didn't optimize the injection project of contrast mixture, especially the dose of contrast mixture. So, for CDTA in patients with frequent premature bit, we can use adaptive perspective ECG team that can ensure image quality because of composition technique. But due the long exam time for repeated scan, it often leads to pure enhancement of digital segments in coronary artery. So it required to optimize the injection project of contract media to ensure consistency of enhancement between proxim, proximal and distal segment in coronary artery, especially great enhancement of distal segment. Uh, that's all. Thanks for listening to my speech. These are my personal view. I hope you can help me to improve all them and give me your advice. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Charles' speech. Since he is attending to another meeting, we will pass all the questions to Mr. Charles and let him reply us by email. Now, we move on to the next speaker. The next speaker is Mr. Bing Hu. Mr. Bing Hu is the Vice Professor in the Department of Radiology of the Bird Affiliated Hospital of Shen Yat-sen University in China. He is also a member in Youth Committee Abdominal Group 
of Chinese Society of Radiology. I'm a committee member in the neurology group of Guangdong Province Society of Radiology. Today, his topic is evaluation of MR elastography for production of lymph node metastasis in prostate cancer. Let's welcome Mr. Bing Hu. Good morning, everyone. My topic is evaluation of MR elastography for prediction of lymph node metastasis in prostate cancer. Background Prostate cancer, PCA, is one of the most common cancers in men, and the global burden of this disease is rising. Lymph node metastasis, LNM, is an essential prognostic factor in patients with PCA, which has shown to be a valuable predictor for biochemical recurrence-free survival, metastatic-free survival, and overall survival in PCA. Extended pelvic lymph node dissection, EPLND, is the established measure of staging regional nodes. However, this invasive technique may not have any direct benefit on cancer outcomes. It may result in more substantial adverse consequences in terms of operating time, blood loss, loss of stay, and post-operative complications. Therefore, a non-invasive imaging method is needed to reduce or eliminate the need for EPRND. Many non-invasive imaging techniques have been used to preoptively characterize the lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. Conventional CT and MRI rely on size criteria to determine lymph node status, and a meta-analysis found that the sensitivity and specificity for CT were 42% and 82%. For MRI was 39% and 82% respectively. And the diffusion weighted imaging has a sensitivity and specificity of 55% and 90% in detecting lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. MRE can directly visualize the three dimensional propagating mechanical shear waves and quantitatively measure tissue mechanical property in biological tissues. It's sensitive to the mechanical response of pathophysiology changes in soft tissue. Some studies have shown that MRE has potential for detecting, localizing, and staging prostate cancer. The feasibility of in vivo multifrequency MRE of the prostate and indicated that MRE stiffness maps displayed many details of potential interest for cancer diagnosis. The purpose of this study was to assess the diagnostic performance of MRE by measuring the mechanical properties of the primary prostate cancer, identifying prostate cancer lymph node metastasis preoperatively. 49 patients were enrolled in this study. They were categorized into two groups based on the histopathological results of EPRND. 12 patients with regional lymph node metastasis were included in group 1, prostate cancer with lymph node metastasis, also called positive LNM, and 37 patients without regional lymph node metastasis were included in group 2, 
prostate cancer result lymph node metastasis, also called negative LNM. The figure is the flow chart of patient population in current study. MRI was performed on a 3T scanner with 8 channel phase array torso coils. The table is the pulse sequences and parameters of MRE, multiparametric MRI, and pelvic MRI. The pulse sequences of MRE including 60 Hz and 90 Hz. And the pulse sequences of multiparametric MRI included exo T2 weighted image and exo fat saturated T2 weighted image and exo T1 weighted image and high B value diffusion weighted image and multiple B values diffusion weighted image and DEC dynamic contrast enhanced images. The pulse sequences of pelvic MRI including sagittal T2 weighted images, coronary T2 weighted images, and contrast T1 weighted images. MRE was performed with a custom built passive driver. It was applied to the lower abdominal wall, partially overlapping the symphysis pubis. Continuous acoustic vibration and 60 Hz and 90 Hz, which were generated by an active driver and transmitted to the passive driver via flexible vinyl tube to produce propagating cell waves in the prostate. A test of vibration was first applied to allow the patient to get familiar with the vibration. A free breathing multi slice EPI 3D MRE sequence was used to image the waves. The MRE acquired displacement fields were processed using 3D direct inversion and rhythm. The cell stiffness was calculated from the wave images using by first calculating the curl and the divergence of the wave information. The processing steps were applied aut automatically to generate quantitative images of tissue shear stiffness maps in units of kilopascals. A 73-year-old man with prostate cancer, red arrow, without lymph node metastasis. The tumor was shown homogeneous moderate hyperintense on T2-weighted image and hyperintense on diffusion weighted image. The tumor stiffness was 4.17 kPa on 3D elastogram and 60 Hz and was 5.83 kPa and 90 Hz. A 60-year-old man with prostate cancer and with lymph node metastasis the tumor, red arrow, was shown moderate hyperintense on T2-weighted image and hyperintense on diffusion-weighted image. The tumor stiffness was 5.76 kPa on 3D elastogram and 60 Hz and was 6.09 kPa at 90 Hz. An enlarged lymph node, yellow arrow, was found on T2-weighted image and diffusion-weighted image. Because the stiffness value of lymph nodes was similar with the stiffness value of surrounding structures, the lymph nodes was hardly direct visible in the elastogram. The color bar had an image of 3D elastogram from purple to right indicated the stiffness value from low to high. The stiffness value of surrounding structures was lower than that of the prostate and prostate cancer. So most of the surrounding structures were in purple and blue.
Well, the colors of the prostate and the prostate cancer. The mean prostate cancer stiffness at 60 Hz in the group with lymph node metastasis was significantly higher than that in the group without lymph node metastasis. And the mean prostate cancer stiffness at 90 Hz in group with lymph node metastasis was significantly higher than that in group without lymph node metastasis. Mean stiffness of prostate cancer was calculated and recorded in Kilopascal using a manually specified region of interest. The RIS was drawn independently by two radiologists who were experienced in reading MRE images. They were blended to all clinical and histopathological results, and these two radiologists were also experienced in multiparametric MRI and pelvic MRI. All images and lesions were scored and reported according to the prostate imaging report and the data system, high-res version 2.1 criteria. They are the individual results of MRE stiffness at 60 Hz and at 90 Hz for each reader. Inter-observer agreement of the prostate cancer stiffness measurements between two radiologists were evaluated using the intra-class correlation coefficient ICC. There were excellent inter-observer reproducibilities of prostate cancer stiffness at 60 Hz and 90 Hz with an intra-class correlation coefficient ICC of 0 0.839 and 0 0.887 respectively. Univariate and multivariate logistic regression analysis were performed to test the association between the preoperative variables and lymph node metastasis. Our study showed that prostate cancer MRE stiffness was a significant marker for predicting lymph node metastasis with high ultimatum. Because there were collinearity between prostate cancer MRE stiffness at 60 Hz and at 90 Hz, two multivariable modes were fitted respectively. According to forward stepwise regression based on maximum likelihood estimation, in mode 1, prostate cancer MRE stiffness at 60 Hz and maximum diameter were independent significant variables for predicting lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. In mode 2, prostate cancer MRE stiffness at 90 Hz and maximum diameter were independent significant predictor. In the table, we can find the diagnostic performance of two significant imaging findings and their combination for predicting lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. The sensitivity, specificity, PPV, NPV, and the accuracy of the combination in mode 1 were 100%, 91.9%, 93.9%, Eighty percent, one hundred percent, and ninety-three point nine percent, respectively, with an AUC value of zero point nine eight two. The sensitivity, specificity, PPV, NPV, and accuracy of the combination in more two were. 
and 89.8% respectivity, with an AUC value of 0 0.975. There was no statistically significant difference between the AUCs of mod 1 and mod 2. Discussion Prostate cancer MRE stiffness and maximum diameter were independent and significant predictors of lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. Combining these two MRI findings for predicting lymph node metastasis resulted in high predictive accuracy with high sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. An increased extracellular matrix ECM stiffness may contribute to an overall increase in tumor stiffness, and some components of ECM are involved in the process of lymph node metastasis. A hypothesis might be that increased MRE stiffness of prostate cancer could predict lymph node metastasis by reflecting the remodeling of ECM. Because there was collinearity between prostate cancer MRE stiffness at 60 Hz and at 90 Hz, these two parameters couldn't be fitted in one multivariable mode at the same time. The conclusion is that a combination of prostate cancer MRE stiffness and maximum diameter can be used as a preoperative imaging marker for predicting lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. Now, there are take home points. First, prostate lesion stiffnesses and maximum diameter were independent predictors for lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. Second, among the significant variables, prostate lesion stiffness showed a high out ratio at multivariate analysis. Third, a combination of prostate lesion stiffness and maximum diameter had high sensitivity and high specificity for predicting lymph node metastasis of prostate cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hu. Also, we will pass all the questions to Mr. Hu and let him reply us by email. And I would like to thank for the informative talks of our two speakers. This is the end of this session. Thank you, Mr. Avinow and our panelists. Please enjoy a video clip we have prepared for you. Our next session will begin 15 minutes afterwards. Thank you.
A system with helium-free MR operations cannot run for 24 hours a day. Based on a decade of innovation, we've revolutionized MR operations with the Ingenia Ambition 1.5T. Its groundbreaking Blue Seal magnet operates with only seven liters of helium. This fraction of the usual amount of helium is placed in the magnet during manufacturing and then fully sealed, enclosing the coolant for the rest of its lifetime. No helium can escape, and the system will stay cool, ensuring hours and hours of continuous high-performance scanning and creating peace of mind from potential helium complications. But it would not be such a game-changer if it only revolutionized helium-free MR operations. Also, no compromises are made on speed, patient comfort, staff comfort, and clinical confidence. You'll be amazed at what you can do without 1,493 liters of helium in your MR system. Healthcare professionals around the world are united by a common mission to help patients lead healthier and longer lives. For more than a century, Siemens Healthineers has pushed the boundaries of medical technology and people have benefited from every innovation. More precise diagnostics, advanced therapies, better treatment outcomes, and ultimately, a higher quality of life. Our aim is to harness the power of digitalization and connectivity and make healthcare more personal and caring. State-of-the-art imaging and lab diagnostics lead to faster and more accurate diagnoses. Digital integration frees up medical staff from routine tasks, leaving more time for patients. Artificial intelligence and digital twins lay the foundation for treatments that are truly tailored to the needs of each individual patient. Today, we may not know what healthcare will be like in 50 years, but no doubt, we at Siemens Health & Ears are at the forefront in shaping it. With the latest technology, with the unparalleled expertise and passion of our employees, with strong partners in scientific research, in close cooperation with our customers, but above all, for people.
what is deep intelligence? For us at Canon Medical, it encompasses many things. Introducing the Aquilian One Prism Edition. AI-assisted imaging is deep intelligence. Combining the power of our advanced intelligent Clear IQ engine with spectral deep learning reconstruction is deep intelligence. Being able to distinguish true signal from noise to deliver exceptional scans without compromising on speed and dose is deep intelligence. An integrated end-to-end -end spectral workflow that includes a 160 mm volume scan and an extensive suite of spectral analysis applications is deep intelligence. With the new Aquilian One Prism Edition, deep intelligence is integrated into every scan for every patient, now and long into the future.
Welcome back. Let us begin the second part of our academic forum. Let's welcome the first speaker, Mr. Dragon Hong Long Liu. Mr. Dragon Hong Long Liu is the vice chairman of Hong Kong Radiographers Association. Also, he is the chairman of Hong Kong Association of Radiation Therapists. He is also a certified medical dosimetrist in the United States. He got his master's degree in radiation science in University of Sydney in Australia. Today, his topic is advanced radio therapy technique, eccentric dynamic. Let's welcome Mr. Dragon Liu. Good morning, my name is Dragon Liu. I'm a radiation therapist in Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. Uh, today, I would like to share with you my presentation topics Advanced Therapy Techniques of Brain Tumor by using our new Exetrack Dynamic System. This is my agenda of today's presentation. I will go through the background of this sharing session, then I will introduce the Exetrack System of the components to all of you, and let you know and show you the workflows of our Exetrack system. Finally, we will have a brief discussion about the advantage and the disadvantage. My working place is um, Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong, and my department is Department of Clinical Oncology. In my department, we de uh, de develop into two sessions. One is chemotherapy, another one is radiotherapy. I'm working in a radiotherapy session. Um, under this session, we provide the external beam treatment, therapy and nuclear medicine to the cancer patients. In the external beam session, we have a uh, five Linux and two CT SIM. All five Linux are in variant brand. I would like to share with you um, how we deliver a high accurate treatment to the brain tumor by using the exact track system. The brain tumor, for example, uh, acoustic neuroma is very small in size. We need highly precision treatment accuracy. And the movement of the patient may result of the inaccuracy of the beam delivery and increase the side effect of the patient and even worse the treatment outcome. The increased side effect, the patient may suffer dizziness, memory loss, stroke-like symptoms and a poor brain function. For the transition, IMLT and SLT, not enough to maintain intrafractionated position accuracy. We need to integrate with modern imaging and surface sky technique to deliver such high standard treatment, so-called IGLT and surface sky radiotherapy. And a seamless imaging procedure throughout the SLT or the SLS treatment to make sure the intrafractional accuracy and the eccentric dynamic which combine this IGLT and the surface guided treatment together. Eccentric dynamic is the trademark of the brain lab equipment. It unifies the power and the precision of the cutting edge tracking technologies. It delivers high precision treatments for a wide range of patient positioning and the monitoring workflows, including the cranial and prostate. The system can install on both variant and elector machine to deliver a high precision treatment. In 2021, my hospital, Prince of Wales Hospital, installed the etc. System, system to our true beam machine. The main treatment case of us are using to treat the head and neck and the brain treatment region. For example, the acoustic neuroma and AVM. This is the picture I captured from the Brain Lab website to show you how the Exetrax dynamic system is installed on both variant and the latter machine. Now, uh, let me to introduce the components of the Exetrax dynamic system to all of you. They include the first part, the thermal surface tracking camera. The second component is the real-time X-ray monitoring. The third part is the 6-degree robotic couch.
Thermal tracking system consists of 4D thermal cameras, create an accurate and reliable hybrid thermal surface by correlating the patient heat signature to their reconstruct 3D surface structure. To achieve this, 300,000 3D surface points are acquired and matched to the heat signals generated by the thermal camera, creating another dimension to track their position. You can see from the picture, there is the example of the, how the thermal camera are working on the patient's surface to detect their position. Another part of the component is the advanced X-ray tubes. The advanced X-ray tube provides real-time X-ray imaging. The largest panels show more anatomy for easier orientation and interpretation of X-ray images. At the same time, improved soft tissue contrast and enhanced readout speed prevent motion blurring effects. The higher heat capacity of the X-ray tubes support more automatically high-frequency imaging. The 6D robotic couch. A standard Linda couch can correct patient position in 4D of freedom. However, improved setup accuracy is necessary to avoid irradiation of critical structures, especially for head, neck, spine, prostate, and other SLS or SBLT case. Excitrex provide a fully integrated robotic module that allows for optimal patient positioning in all six degrees of freedom and able and improved setup accuracy compared to the translational corrections alone. Now, with Accenture 6.6 versions, both the couch and robotic motion can be enabled directly from the treatment console with no need to enter the treatment room. It's made more convenient to, the, to us and the faster treatment to the patients. These are the pictures I taken in my hospital. You can see the thermal detection cameras. The blue light is to detect the temperature on the patient's surface. Then RT can visual the patient's surface temperature on the monitor, inside or outside the treatment room. The red and yellow represent the different temperature of the patient's face. For the immobilizations, there are three types of head and neck immobilization device in Xetrax dynamic system. The first one is the cranial 4PI zero-static mask. This mask is used for is used for high accuracy SLS treatment. This mask consists of two anterior sheets, a custom nose bridge, and a patient's specific posterior mask. Second one is cranial 4PI open face mask. This mask is ideal for claustrophobic patients or surface tracking for cranial indications case. This mask features a single open face anterior sheet and a patient specific posterior mask. The third one is a cranial 4PI basic mask. It is designed for the treatments requiring less accuracy, like hoponality, palliative treatment. This mask consists of a single closed faces anterior sheet and a comfortable carbon-based headrest. Now we are moving to the workflow. Um, I'm picking up uh, one case of example. This is a uh, acoustic neuroma. The dose prescription is 50.4 gray in 28 fraction, and the field arrangement is 7 fields art with non coplanar uh, arrangement. We are using the Bring Lab eye plan for the planning system for this case. From the picture, you can see my colleague immobilized, immobilized the patient by using the uh, zero-static mask. We aim to position the patient to the planted area according to the planning CT. The monitor show the real-time positions of the patient 
related to the planted position. The couch will move to follow the planted positioning automatically by press and hold the couch pendant or the remove pendant, then go for the X-ray verification step. X-ray verification, like the uh, picture show, uh, a pair of ceiling X-ray tube takes the image from two angles. X-ray images are matched on the software side with extended DLLs for better visualization of an easier orientation within the patient anatomy. Fusion tools such as a rubber band Snapback Fusion's functionality further simplify the verification process. Then auto matching of the DLLs to correct the difference in the position by Octo 60 cow shift. During the radiation treatment, surface thermal detector continuous monitor the position change of the patient. If the change is larger than threshold value, for example 1 mm, the warning signal out of tolerance will appear on the screen. Then the system will trigger the X-ray verification automatically to verify the patient uh, position. This is a short video to show you how the x system working on. Now, the system takes the X-ray images and the verification by octal matching. After they match the images, they will automatically move to the right position and the treatment will going on. This is a short video to show you how the Xetrix system working on. You can see the thermal detector is continuous monitor the patient position and sometimes they will trigger the X-ray to verify the patient position. So, finally, let's to discuss the advantage of the Xetrax system. The advantage of the Xetrax system are their deep LinNet integration. It integrates with high-end LinNet, enables not only automatic patient loading, but also automated beam hole based on precess surface and X-ray tolerance. The same deep level of integrations allows for the automatic uh, triggering of X-rays based on predefined gantry angles or MU intervals. And the system can do the non co pregnant monitoring. etc. dynamic continuous verifies the patient initial position with X-ray imaging throughout the treatment delivery. Even at non co pregnant couch angles, during beam on, the system can detect potential patient misalignment helping to mitigate the treatment errors. And the treatment time of this system is very fast. For the limitation of the Xetrax system, due to the design for the SLT or SLS purpose of this machine, the micro MLC installed in the gantry will limit the machine field size. In our hospital, the machine's limitation to field size is the X draw is only is 40 cm, but for the Y draw is only 21 cm. So other than the SLT or SLS, the case variety are limited. We cannot treat a large field uh, case in this machine, need to move to another machine. And the disadvantage up to now, uh, we found that there has some interference of the thermal detector while the gantry is moving. This problem will trigger the X-ray verification process. 
to verify the patient position. It sometimes it may take more radiation to the patient and uh, sometimes um, increase the treatment time. This is pending the improved by the manufacturer. We hope in the, in the coming future, this can be uh, improved by the software update. So for this presentation, I need to acknowledge my colleagues and the Hong Kong Association of Radiation Therapies. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Liu, for your lecture. The Q&A part will be put at the end of this section. Now, we move on to the next speaker. The fourth speaker is Ms. Cora Ng. Ms. Cora Ng is the Financial Director of Macau Radiological Technologies Association. Also, she is the Principal Radiological Technologies in Department of Radiology of St. General Hospital of Health Bureau in Macau. She got her Bachelor Degree of Biological Imaging and Radiological Science from Yangming University in Taiwan. Her topic is Brief Introduction of the Radiation Safety Management in Public Hospital in Macau. Let's welcome Ms. Cora Ng. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cora Ng from Macau Radiological Technologies Association. Today, I would like to introduce how we do the radiation safety management in the public hospital in our city. I believe everyone knows about the public hospitals in Australia have been accredited by international hospital accreditation programs. And the accreditation is based on the setup of standards and procedures to ensure the process of carrying out high quality and safe healthcare services by medical professionals. The public hospital in Macau have passed the accreditation of the Australian Council on Healthcare Standards, in short form is ACHS, and equipped is an assessment and quality improvement program developed and implemented by the ACHS. It served as a framework for the management of medical and healthcare service to ensure high quality and safe services and to achieve quality improvement. Radiation safety management of public hospital in Macau is the responsibility of the radiation safety team which is one of the branches of the Occupational Safety and Health category of the Hospital Risk Management Team. Based on the hospital's access to the ACHS hospital accreditation, there are different categories of hospital safety management working groups, such as chemical safety team, manual handling teams, etc. Our radiation safety team was established for radiation safety, and it was the origin of the group. The functions and goal of the radiation safety team are mainly for all personnel, radiation equipment, and radiation sites under the hospital. To review and assist in the development of relevant operational guidelines for personal radiation dose monitoring, safe use of radiation equipment, maintenance of equipment and size, continuous training for staffs, revision of radiation protective material inspection regulation and operational guidelines, and follow up of the implementation of the work. Last but not least, conduct radiation safety audits throughout the hospital. The team regulates radiation safety in hospital by revising operational guidelines. On the left picture shows the first edition of the radiation safety operational guidelines established by the team. And on the right pic is a part of its catalog. The team is now continuously updating and optimizing this operational guidelines and is going to launch the latest version.
When we're talking about the object of radiation safety monitoring, are mainly divided into three categories. First is personal, second equipment, and third size. Targeting to personal radiation dose and the utilization of radiation dose emitters for stops, to maintenance for radiation equipment, and monitoring to radiation size. In the area of personal radiation monitoring, the hospital had appointed its radiation protection supervisor in each department who used radiation surface since 2017, and the radiation safety team is responsible for relevant training. Each supervisor is responsible for the personal radiation dose meter settlement of his department and also supervising the staff to use it correctly and recording the personal radiation dose record of the department, etc., so as to achieve more comprehensive radiation safety protection. On this slide, it shows an example of personal radiation dose monitoring report, which summarized the use of radiation dose meters and settlement of each staff in the monitoring department using the fixed sampling period. A list of data such as, is there any radiation dose existing the standard and average deliver ratio of the radiation dose meters, so that each department can understand its situation that makes improvement. In addition to personal radiation doses, the radiation safety team will also monitor the radiation equipment of the hospital, including the number of maintenance plan and its actual implementation, and the comprehensive weight of maintenance performed according to the established schedule. On the figure, it shows an example of the radiation equipment maintenance plan and the implementation monitoring report, which summarized the comprehensive rate of fixed radiation equipment and mobile radiation equipment in a fixed sampling period according to the schedule. It lists out data such as plant maintenance time during a fixed inspection period and the number of execution date which is advanced or delayed by less than five days, and the compliance rate of radiation equipment maintenance according to established schedule, etc. In this way, each department can understand its situation that makes improvement. Besides, the radiation safety team will also monitor the radiation site of the hospital. During the period, and the inspection of the radiation site will be monitored. The result of the inspection is included. And the conference rate of each radiation site inspection in accordance with the established schedule. On this fact, it shows an example of the radiation site inspection plan monitoring. It summarizes the number of plan inspection of the relevant site during a fixed period, the number of execution dates which is advanced or delayed by less than five days, and the radiation site according to the established schedule. The accompanying weight of each radiation site inspection in accordance with the established schedule, so that the relevant departments and engineer can understand the situation for follow-up. Continuous training on radiation protection and safe operation training takes an important role in maintaining radiation safety. The radiation safety team is responsible for publishing and regularly update training materials on the intranet for radiation protection and the utilization on personal radiation dosimeters, and strengthen the knowledge of radiation safety among colleagues through provide training for new staffs and radiation protection supervisor in relevant department. At the same time, the team will also help training on radiation protection materials inspection in January 2017. Here's 
show parts of the radiation safety online training material. For staff who speak English or Portuguese, we also provide an English version. In this way, we can ensure all of the staff can clearly understand the relevant training. And here shows part of the online training on the utilization of personal radiation dosimeters. Same as the radiation safety training, there is an English version. In addition to amending the operation and optimizing the radiation safety operational guidelines for hospitals, radiation monitoring and continuous training. The radiation safety team has also revised the regulation and operational guidelines for radiation protection materials inspection. Besides, in January 2017, we conduct training on radiation protection material inspection and continued to follow up the implementation in the hospital. Also, advice on the use and the proper storage of radiation protection materials in various departments. Here is an example of the radiation protection material inspection report of the hospital, which lists out the number, weight, lead equivalent, inspection date, the inspector, inspection result, date for next inspection, and other inspection data. The inspector will also record the status of the inspected material by photo and drafts a report for the department. The team conducts radiation safety audits for all departments in the hospital annually that use the radiation surface or have radiation sites and equipment. To give out suggestions for improvement and follow up on the result of the previous audit. Here shows an example of the radiation safety audit. There are 13 items of the audit, which including the use and the management of sites and equipment, radiation protection materials, and personal radiation dosimeters. On this picture shown on the slide, our colleagues are conducting radiation safety audits. On the left picture, the radiation protection supervisor is showing the auditors the radiation safety guidelines and personal radiation dose files. On the middle picture, the radiation protection supervisor is showing the radiation warning signs and posters to the auditors. On the right page, the auditors is checking the storage and the quantity of the radiation protection materials. Right, you can continue with live talk. Yes, uh, maybe there's uh, some uh, there's some technical problem. We are fixing it. Please wait for a while. The team will yes. also yes. monitor the radiation site of the hospital during the period, and uh, the inspection of the radiation site will be monitored. The result of the inspection is included. And the conference rate of each radiation site inspection in accordance with the established schedule. On this fact, it shows an example of the radiation site inspection plan monitoring. It summarizes the number of plan inspection of the relevant site during a fixed period. 
the number of execution date which is advanced or delayed by less than five days, and the radiation site according to the established schedule. The accompanying weight of each radiation site inspection in accordance with the established schedule, so that the relevant departments and engineer can understand the situation for follow-up. Continuous training on radiation protection and safe operation training takes an important road in maintaining radiation safety. The radiation safety team is responsible for publishing and regularly update training materials on the intranet for radiation protection and the utilization on personal radiation dosimeters, and strengthen the knowledge of radiation safety among colleagues through provide training for new staffs and radiation protection supervisor in relevant department. At the same time, the team will also help training on radiation protection materials inspection in January 2017. Here show parts of the radiation safety online training material. For staffs who speak English or Portuguese, we also provide an English version. In this way, we can ensure all of the staffs can clearly understand the relevant training. And here shows part of the online training on the utilization of personal radiation dosimeters. Same as the radiation safety training, there is an English version. In addition to amending the operation and optimizing the radiation safety operational guidelines for hospitals, radiation monitoring and continuous training, the radiation safety team has also revised the regulation and operational guidelines for radiation protection materials inspection. Besides, in January 2017, we conduct training on radiation protection material inspection and continued to follow up the implementation in the hospital. Also, advice on the use and the proper storage of radiation protection materials in various departments. Here is an example of the radiation protection material inspection report of the hospital, which lists out the number, weight, lead equivalent, inspection date, the inspector, inspection result, date for next inspection, and other inspection data. The inspector will also record the status of the inspected material by photo and drafts a report for the department. The team conducts radiation safety audits for all departments in the hospital annually that use the radiation surface or have radiation sites and equipment. To give out suggestions for improvement and follow up on the result of the previous audit. Here shows an example of the radiation safety audit. There are 13 items of the audit which including the use and the management of sites and equipment, radiation protection materials, and personal radiation dosimeters. On this picture showed on the slide, our colleagues are conducting radiation safety audits. On the left picture, the radiation protection supervisor is showing the auditors the radiation safety guidelines and personal radiation dose files. On the middle picture, the radiation protection supervisor is showing the radiation warning signs and posters to the auditors. On the right pane, the auditors is checking the storage and the quantity of the radiation protection materials. It's lead aprons on this page in the radiology department. As a conclusion, the radiation safety management of public hospital in Macau is mainly carried out by the radiation safety team in the occupational safety and health category under the risk management group of the hospital. 
The radiation safety in public hospital in Macau is maintained through drafting and reviewing relevant guidelines for all personnel, radiation equipment and sites, providing advice and recommendations on personal radiation dose monitoring, safe operational on radiation equipment, equipment and site maintenance, continuous training, and annual audits. That's all of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Cora, for your lecture. Now, we move on to the next speaker. Here comes our last speaker, Mr. Jerry Kai Hong Lei. Mr. Jerry Kai Hong Lei is the Vice President of Macau Radiological Technologies Association. He is also a Senior Radiological Technologist in Department of Radiology of St. General Hospital of Health Bureau in Macau. He got his Bachelor Degree of Diagnostic Radiography in University of Sydney in Australia. Today, his topic is discussion on frontline radiation protection techniques during interventional procedure in Macau Hospital. Let's welcome Mr. Jerry Kai Hong Lei. Dear colleagues and friends, thank you for joining me here today. I'm Jerry, Vice President of the Macau Radiological Technologies Association, the MLTA. It's my pleasure here today to share with you my experiences of frontline radiation protection techniques while doing interventional procedures in Macau Hospital. Since I'm a frontline radiological technologist, I will mainly focus on talking about the practical and technical aspects of radiation protection during interventional procedure. I will be talking about interventional procedures that involve the use of ionizing radiation. Briefly explaining the aims of radiation protection, discussing some frontline interventional radiation protection techniques for patients, discussion, discussing some frontline interventional radiation protection techniques for our staff members. First, okay. let's have a look about radiation. As you can see on the graph, radiation can be classified into non-ionizing radiation and ionizing radiation. Non-ionizing radiation is low energy, not enough to change the chemical properties of our body tissue. However, ionizing radiation is high energy, enough to cause chemical changes and damage of our body tissue. Since interventional procedure involves in using X-ray guide fluoroscopy, X-ray is a type of ionizing radiation. As I mentioned before, that ionizing radiation could be harmful, that we need to be alert while using it. Now, let's have a quick look at the aims of radiation protection. The purposes of radiation protections are to prevent deterministic effect and to lower the chance of stochastic effect. So in terms of deterministic effect, there's a threshold dose to trigger this effect. Cataract, hair loss, skin burn are the examples of this effect. However, deterministic effects can be avoided with proper radiation protection. Stochastic effects such as cancer, genetic effect. Stochastic effect has no threshold dose. However, it is unlikely to happen with proper radiation protection. Well, after a brief introduction to the purposes of radiation protection, let's take a look at this table. 
this table roughly shows the patient doses from some common diagnostic exams. As you can see, a very common exam, chest X-ray, has an effective dose of 0.02 millisievert, which is similar to the dose you're walking outside for two and a half days. Now, we use chest X-ray as references. To compare with another very common exam, HCT, a HCT dose is a hundred times the dose of chest X-ray, which is a lot. All right. Now, let's look at the dose of interventional procedures. The doses of vascular stain and PTCA procedure are 520 and 750 times, 55 times the dose of a chest X-ray, which they are more higher than the common CT scan. The reason of such high dose with regard to interventional procedure is mainly due to relatively long procedure time as well as continuing using X-ray guidance is needed be during the procedure. Well, we've talked about interventional procedures not just involving the use of ionizing X-ray, but also having relatively higher dose compared with that in common diagnostic exam. Therefore, proper radiation protection techniques must be used when working in intervention room in order to protect the patients and the staff members. Now, let's move on talking about the interventional radiation protection techniques. But before that, I want to bring up a question. Where the patient and staff member doses mainly come from when doing interventional procedure? As you can see the picture, radiation doses to patient is mainly from the primary beam. However, radiation dose to the staff members is mainly come from the scatter radiation. Say like, every 1,000 photons emit from the X-ray tube, 100 and, 100 and 200 are scatter radiation, only 20 arrives the detector. The rest of them are absorbed by the patient. Now, all of us, all of us should know about patient dose is mainly from the primary, primary beam. So as a technologist, we are the gatekeeper. We need to do our very best to protect the patient from the primary beam. Here are some of my experiences that I would like to share with you about radiation protection to the patients. After that, I will talk about radiation protection to the staff members. First, let's look at the picture. First point, maximize distance between the patient and the X-ray tube. According to inverse, inverse square law, Intensity is inversely proportional to the distance. So, further the patient is from the tube, further the patient is from the tube, the lower the radiation intensity the patient will receive. And number two, minimizing the distance between patient and the IR detector. Due to auto brightness control, if patient detect, de patient detector distance increase, 
the auto blindness control will call for an, ex an increase of x-ray here x-ray output increase of x-ray output in order to obtain the optimal images another point is minimize fluoroscopy time very simple the shorter the exposure time the lesser the, the dose the patient will get also keep record of the screening time and also the dose report for every patient another point is to use post fluoroscopy and post acquisition try to use the lowest brain wave where possible. Another point is to avoid exposing the same area of skin. If we keep irritating, irritating the same body part with the same angle for a long time, that body part skin will start to heat up and result in forming a hot spot. If it is severe, it will cause skin burn. As I mentioned before, skin burn is one of the deterministic effects that we can avoid with proper radiation protection technique. What we need to, what we need to do in this case as a gatekeeper, we should notify the doctor from time to time to expose the patient, expose the patient through different <laughs> angle and different skin entry point to avoid skin burn from happening. From happening. In terms of radiation protection to patient. There is one thing we cannot control, that is the body thickness. The thicker the patient, the higher the x-ray energy that needs to penetrate. Therefore, the higher the dose that the patient will receive. As shown in the picture, every 5 millimeters increase in body thickness, the patient dose will be double. So, in order to get lesser dose, what we only can do is to keep ourselves light and fit, if possible. Another point is, not try not to use uh, too much the oblique or the lateral projection. Why? Because when you use the oblique and the lateral position, the projection, they will increase the patient dose due to the longer travel distances compared with, you see the AP, the PA. Also, avoid using magnification. When using magnification, the II detector will adjust, will adjust focusing due to increase the number of photons per unit area of the IR detector. The, AB, the, the ABC system, auto brightness control system, mm will increase the radiation output to maintain the same brightness. The number on the right show where magnification is double. Say like here, from 12 to 6. The dose will increase from 100 to 400. 
which is four times more. Also, try to avoid using acquisition mode. Acquisition mode is taking serial snap snapshots, and this dose rate is approximately 10 to 60 times the normal fluoroscopy dose rate. Also, collimate use collimation. Try to collimate to the region of re of interest. Technologists need to know the anatomy well. Try not to chop off the region of interest. Otherwise, the doctor is going to complain. Well, I've just finished talking about frontline radiation protection techniques for patients under interventional procedures. So, what are the interventional radiation protection techniques for our staff members? Remember, I've mentioned that radiation protection for patients is to deal with the primary beam. While radiation protection for staff members is to deal with the scattering. Before that, here's a slogan about interventional radiation protection I want to share with you. That is, reducing patient dose always results in staff member dose reduction. This makes sense, right? Okay. In terms of interventional radiation protection for staff members, we should always apply the TDS principle to our work. T stands for time. Minimize exposure time. D stands for distance. Maximize distance from the source where possible. S stands for shield. Always use shielding. These pictures show why distance is so important when doing intervention imaging. Have a look at the floor, floor plan view. This is CR, where the radiation source is. And this is the examination table, where the patient lie on. And this is this is the shielding around the source. And this is the mobile shielding located near the end of the table. So we forget about the units. Just look at the numbers. The number represents the dose. What we want to talk about here is where the, the technologist should stand when doing interventional procedure. Where? Where possible, the technologist, technologist should try to stay away from the source, from the radiation source. We should try to stand either near the exam, the end of the exam table, or stand behind the mobile shield. These two points are safe for technologists to, to, stand, to stand when doing the procedure. Also, we must wear personal radiation protective gear such as lead goggles, flyweight shield, lead apron before going to work in the interventional room. When wearing lead apron, since the thickness of the commonly used apron, apron 
is 0.25 millimeters back. It is very, very important for us to distinguish the front side and the and the black and the back side. The two pieces from the front side should be overlapped and wrapped around so that the thickness will become 0 .0 0 0.5. This is based on the fact that 0 0.5 lead equivalent will give a protection rate of greater than 90%. Meanwhile, since the front has 90% 90 per, 90 protection rate, we should face the radiation source or face the C-arm when we are working. Ideally, lead apron should extend to at least the level of the knees. Too long, you will get tricked and fall. Too short, your, your uh, protective region, reproductive region, is not being protected. Moreover, after using the lead, lead, the lead apron or the lead gowns, they must be hung up properly. Don't throw them everywhere because this will cause cracks and lose their protective effect. In terms of shielding, the common ones we used are the ceiling mount, screen, lateral shield, also under table curtain. Mobile force shield can be also used where possible. Radiological technologist as a gatekeeper should remind the doctor to keep their hands away from the exposure field. As you can see here, it is incorrect. The hands under the exposure field. This is correct. Hand away from the field from the exposure field. Hands being exposed in the field not only will increase the staff skin dose. Why? As you can see here, increase of thickness. It will also increase the, the patient dose due to the increase of thickness. It is necessary. Disposable lead gloves can be used. When doing intervention, we should always use the undercouch technique. Undercouch technique is to keep the X-ray tube under the table. Why keep the tube under? As the X-ray tube emit the primary beams, when this hit the patient, it produce scatter. Scattering is the one we need to deal with regarding the staff member dose. So, we need to keep the tube under the table because we have the lateral shielding. Also, we have the mount under table shielding, providing protection from, the, from scattering. Plus, we have our net apron that gives double protection from the scattering. When the arm is moved to lateral position, we should stand on 
the detector size. It is because the detector size scatter is much lower than that at the tube side. The det detector side is the secondary scatter. The tube side, the x-ray hit the patient and we will get the primary scatter. As you can see here, red, which means here the scatter radiation is, is a lot. Here, green, you can see this is the lower part. All personnel who involved in working inside the interventional room must wear personal dosimeter, or what we call PLM. Personal dosimeter should be worn at the chest or the waist level, inside the leg gown. Last but not least, shell keep updating and reviewing our radiation protection knowledge regularly. In Macau, our society, the MLTA, regularly holds radiation protection lectures, not just for the radiological technologists, but also for all medical personnel. In my hospital where I work, we have to log in to the hospital intranet to do the medically related or nine knowledge training every now and then. Radiation protection knowledge training is one of them. To sum up my presentation, there are only four points, but very important four points. First, radiation protection for patient is to deal with the primary beam from the tube while radiation protection for staff members is to deal with the scattering from the patient. Second, always a good use of the TDS principle, time distance shielding. Always bear in mind good use of this principle. Number three, reducing patient dose always result in staff member dose reduction. That's very common sense. Number four, stay out of the room if not necessary. So here are my references. This is the end of my presentation. I hope everyone stays safe and well. I look forward to seeing you all again soon, face to face. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay, uh, thank you all the speakers for the speech. I Now we are going to the Q&A section. And uh, so the, there are some questions from our chat box. The first question is uh, for Mr. Dragon Liu. Hello, Dragon. Are you there? Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, Can Dragon. Yeah. 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 I know you have answered the question by typing uh, in the Q&A box, but I think the other audience also want to know about that. Okay. One audience want to ask, is an implantation device need for the body and can it be done and, and can it be done on uncooperative patient in this? Yes, for the, yeah, because I just mentioned my my exact track system because we are treating for the uh, high accuracy case. Uh, so for this high accuracy, we need to do some immobilization device for the patient. Even for the body treatment, we sometimes we will apply the wet lock to the patient to treat uh, the body region. So it's very important for the immobilization device for the patient. For the uh, co cooperative uh, case, for example, like a head and neck case, because so, so many organs inside our head, it's very difficult to do the surgery. So for this case, um, 
the, radi the radiotherapy is the very best option for those patients who need to who, who need to the uh, treatment, especially for the cancer patient, because the lesion inside the head is very difficult to use the surgery method to take it out. So um, radiotherapy is a very uh, important and very best option for them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dragon. Thank and, you. And the second question will uh, go to Cora. Cora, are you there? Hello. Um, okay. Um, Okay, uh, the question is for, is there any specific course for radiation safety program in your region? And is radiographers can able to pursue the job in the absence uh, of radiation safety supervisor? Okay, let me answer. Uh, for the first question, previously, uh, we will do the radiation safety uh, prote or radiation protection uh, training course uh, face-to-face -face, like CPD mode, but uh, due to the need to maintain social distance during the COVID-19 epidemic time. So this kind of the education course on the radiation safety are uh, conducting in the form of online self-learning now. So for the second question, as I mentioned be uh, before, the radiation safety supervisor of each department in the public hospital in Macau are responsible for the use, proper storage and the file preservation of the personal radiation dosimeters, uh, for example, TLD of the departments. Uh, to correct manage the preservation of the radiation protection materials, for example, the apron, uh, Etc. So, in the department who use radiation surface, such as the imaging department, for example, radiographers can also handle this job. Thank you. And I also want to ask a question to you, Cora. And you say that we'll get the TLD badge to monitor our dose. So, how if I overload the dose, I get the exist uh, radio from the TLD? What can we do? I think when this. If we, unfortunately, we got this condition, we have to first report to the person who overdose to the department head, get uh, and then let them let them know about that condition. And then secondary, uh, maybe we have to review the process of how the person used his t his or sh uh, her TLD. Is it uh, improper using the TLD or storage? Etc. So we need to do some review on it or, or do some inspection on it afterwards. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And also there's some question for Jerry. Hello, Jerry, are you there? Hello, Jerry. Oh, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, some questions are for you about the pregnant, pregnant staff. What is uh, the management of your pregnant staff in the radiology department in your hospital? Well, um, according to IAEA, after the female uh, radiation worker, which is uh, who is informed about her pregnancy, um, the dose of the embryo or uh, the fetus must meet the dose limit of the general public for the remaining uh, pregnancy period. So, in my workplace, um, the pregnant uh, female worker usually uh, will be assigned. Uh, to do some the light work, such as um, um, some uh, modality QC, uh, this kind of things, instead of going into the interventional room, because uh, it involves in using a high dose. Like this, hope, hope this answer your question. Okay, and also another question is uh, also want to ask about you and the personal monitor does meet does meters. Is that uh, necessary? Not necessary to wear two meters, one inside the light apron and one outside. Why, why we no need to? The question is about that. Um, where inside is, uh, is good enough. Uh, I, I know the, some, some, some area they will uh, wear the, the, the PLM outside the, like, uh, outside the, the, thyroid, the thyroid region to, to get the comparison. But in Macau, we usually just uh, wear one dosimeter inside the, the leg apron uh, at the chest level or at the waist level, like this. Hope this answers okay. the question. Yes. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So uh, do we have, uh, do the special uh, the panelists have any questions to the speakers, our panelists? Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Long. I have a question. Yeah. yeah. 
uh, baby swimming and Mr. Ping Ho in Yang, Yangdong live, live? Yangdong? Hello? Swimming. Swimming. You hear me? Sim Simming, yes, Simming is not online, so uh, he may not answer your question directly now. He is uh, yeah. attending to okay. another meeting. Okay. Yeah. The first the congratulation in the uh, Macau uh, Society. You are professional. You are very good, <laughs> very nice. Uh, very nice, this webinar, very professional. And start. I have a question for Helio uh, uh, in Hong Kong. How in this time, how about patient, patient before the radiotherapy in treatment? They need to uh, PCR testing before they come in and hospital. Okay. So yes. you, 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 you ask about in this period of time, the COVID-19, yes. if the patient come to my department for the treatment. Okay. Uh, for our department policy, because um, most of the patient will wear the mask to go to the hospital. So if the patient, the treatment region is head and neck, because the head and neck region patient need to remove the mask. So for those patients, we ask them to do the um, COVID test. The COVID test is like the throat, use the salivary, test, to, test, to test the yeah. salivary test, test, uh, test. every week, every week. Yeah. If every mm -hmm. week for those patients is negative, then we will continue the treatment. Okay. Okay. So every the week patient, they, they will do. Yeah. If, if patient come back again, they must test it again. Only one week, one times. One week, one times. One week, one time. If patient, yeah, test, patient go test back, the patient. back home. If patient go back home and yeah. come back in hospital again for yeah. treatment again, you yeah. need we need to test it again. No, no, because the our treatment is every day treatment. Every day yeah. treatment. Let's say mm. the one week, five days, they will come to my treatment. They just only provide with uh, the result within the seven days. It's okay. Mm. Okay. Mm. So after the seven days, they need to undergo the test again. So to prove them in this period of time, they have the negative result, then we can do the treatment for them every day. Yeah. Thank you. Only okay, for the head and neck treatment. Yeah. Yes, I think that's great. Okay. And question for in jury. And how about you very difficult if you, because of some, some of the basin for your age, some of the basin, you necessary, basin, basin got to COVID. You necessary for in your intervention, intervention for, for basin. How you protect in radiation, radiation protect and PPE protect outside. Very difficult. How about in, in your age? Yes, yes. Uh, we Many we still need to we still need to wear the, the protective gown. Yes, we, we must use the PPE. Yes, outside 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 the uh, yeah, yeah. outside the, the apron. Cover. Cover. Yeah, all cover. Yes, also yes. Yeah, we must use the full PPE to do this to, to deal with the the COVID patients. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Mister Law. Have any other questions? No. Hello, Hello, may I ask a question? Yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, in yeah. All, uh, what? yeah. Yeah. According to Radiation Safety Program, I would like to ask Cora. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like to know uh, in the inspection on that apron, any crack is annually is enough or not? Uh, beg your pardon? The inspection on apron, may yeah. I beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah. That apron, yeah. 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 Annually is enough or not? Annually, especially. Oh, okay, okay. We do it annually. annually. Yeah. I, I think annually. it's okay. We we also do it annually. Yeah, for the late yeah. April. Yeah. Uh, which technique uh we uh would you use uh for inspection on late April and Tarashi? Which technique? Oh, we we use both. Uh, we use CT the CT to scan it, or we use also use the the radiation machine to X ray machine to to. Yeah. Scan, yeah, yeah, both use the machine and, and the CT. Okay. Oh, yeah, CT or x ray machine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can I use a fluoroscopy machine in OT? OT? Fluoroscopy? Fluoroscopy is uh, okay or not for inspection on that apron? For COVID patient, you mean? No, 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 no. Uh, let apron. 
let everyone inspection. And I know it's- oh, any crack or any something, yeah. For which kind of patient? Because I cannot- No, no not patient. I, yeah, uh, I wanted to know how to, uh, how to check the crack of let everyone and thyroid shield. Oh, also use the same, the same, the same way as the let apron. The same way yes. for the for the fat edge uh, thyroid shield yeah, yeah. is in the same way. We just cover it on the on the CT table and then and then scan it and then we can you oh. may see any is there any crack on it? Yeah, sure. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, I see Miss Miss Chen. Yeah, Miss Chen Chen I go on. Chen, you need to unmute unmute first. Yeah. Okay. okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. Hello. I would like to thank QMRCA for inviting me for this panelist. And I got a question for Jerry. As we know that pa uh, patient may develop in radiation injury after intervention procedure, especially when the screening time is very high. But normally, it don't happen immediately. So how are you going to? Do you have any protocol to? let the patient know that in case when after the uh, intervention procedure, when they went home and they suddenly developed a uh, radiation injury, how, how should they get treatment? Because treatment also, they need to get uh, people from oncologists, right? To handle the radiation injury. Do you have any protocol on this? So, um. When we when we are doing the, the interventional procedure, uh, if the dose is uh, is uh, like uh, for example the, the accumulate dose is too high, uh, we will get the alert from the machine, and uh, we will get the like uh, the red the red signal uh, uh, from the machine that the patient will get a uh, like a relatively higher dose uh, from this procedure, and. Um, if 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 it, if it if it is possible to happen, uh, like say like uh, if we if, if we we really see see the patient um, like uh, have a hair loss on the table or something like that, we we need to inform the patient to to uh, to for example to go to uh, our emergency department to get some treatment or to observe uh, uh, keep observing and uh, and uh, for a while to see uh, if if any treatment need something like that. Yes, we will, we, will, we, will, we will keep monitoring the, the patient instead of let him go away. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, and uh, it's Pichi Luna, yeah? Please unmute, yeah, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody from Philippines. Firstly, congratulations to uh, Macau uh, Radiological Technologies Association, and thank you for invitation. My question is for Ma'am Cora Ng, yeah? So I would like to ask, are all institutions, be it hospital or a medical clinic, required already to do accreditation? Second is, who are those qualified to undergo radiation safety training to become a radiation safety officer? Thank you. Oh, first question uh, is for my, for my knowledge, because my, my topic is only only mentioned the condition in the public hospital in Macau. So I, I do not have the information enough information for the private one in Macau yet. So this question have to be discussed later. And then the second question. So the for the radiation and protection course or training uh, is provided by the radiation safety team in our hospital, and all the teammates have the accreditation or accredited for the, the knowledge about how to train for the staffs in other departments in the hospital. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, Ms. Dennis. Yes, please. Hi, um, thank you very much for uh, MRTA to invite me to be part of the, the panel and a congratulations for a successful meeting. I have a question for Ms. Cora as well. Okay. Uh, so it's actually about the um, audit reports. So when you perform the screening of the lead aprons, you will have a report that uh, that you type up for the department, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that you report on exactly? Do you report on um, the, the general condition? Is there a specific um, dose reading that you 
indicate on the report or do you also um, recommend any replacement or how long this lead apron can continue to be used? Oh, you mean for the audit report, right? Mm. The report on the audit. Yeah, we will also do it first. We do it uh, by orally when, when we, when we uh, inspecting the, the department. We'll also tell them uh, which part of the uh, facilities, for example, or the condition they need to do some improvement and then uh, make a simple draft for them and then leave the, them to, to do some change. And afterwards, we will leave the uh, detail uh, in the black and white paper, the report, we will send back to, to the hospital and the, both to the leadership of the hospital and the department. They need to mm -hmm. follow up. Um, maybe one year later, we will follow up the condition on how they change the, the, the mistake. Etc. Yeah. Mm. So you give them about a one year period to make any adjustments or changes. Yeah, because we do it mainly annually now. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I think uh, this is the last. Oh, so it's a big thanks to our panelists. Since the scientific meeting is about to end, and let's welcome the president of MRTA, Ms. Falantu Kok, and the chairman of MRTA, Ms. Dennis Yu. Jin Chun to give us a conclusion. Mr. Kok, uh, you unmute first. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, speakers, panelists, and audience. Today we can great success because have all of you. During this COVID-19 pandemic, we have lost a good friend from the Miami. Everybody know Mr. Kim Montian. Mr. Kin was an amazing gentleman, loving and caring, and it's hard to accept that he's not longer in our lives. His passing is a great loss to the radiological technology community. Here on behalf of the Macau Radiological Technologies Association, I express my deepest and heartfelt condolences to the Mr. Kim's families and colleagues. Mr. Kim will be mixed, and may he rest in peace. So thank you to all speakers for participating in our online conference today. Now I'm announced that our annual meeting ends here. Hopefully the pandemic will end soon so we can meet and communicate each other without wearing a mask in the near future. Thank you.
Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. See you on the next ASTBG. Congratulations, MRTA. Congratulations. 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 Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Sukian. Congratulations. 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 See you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Luna. All the students. From yeah. part of President. You are working hard a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank goodbye. You. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.